Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. 1974 was a complicated year for Stevie Nicks. She was 26 years old and she'd released her first major studio album the previous year. It was a collaboration with her musical and romantic partner Lindsay Buckingham, and after it failed to perform, the duo had been dropped by their label. Faced with a career that was ending before it had ever really started, her father offered to pay for her to go back to school to finish her degree so she could become an English teacher like she'd originally planned, but Nix wasn't ready to leave it all behind quite yet. In in the end, they agreed she'd give it six more months. If things weren't getting better by then, she'd break up the band and move on with her life, but she had to give it one more shot. Soon after, she found herself staying at a friend's place in Aspen in the fall while Buckingham went out on tour with Don Everly in the hopes that he could make enough money to sustain the band until their next big break. That tour left Nix alone in the mountain for months, contemplating the crossroads she found herself at between her dream of a career in music and the realities of a career in music. She decided she really did want to make her project with Buckingham work, and she poured all of her emotions, all of that uncertainty, into a ballad that captured the cold sense of loneliness that surrounded her. Three months later, with three months left on the clock, the duo received a surprising invitation to join Fleetwood Mac. It was the sign Nix had been waiting for that all her efforts were actually leading somewhere, and she brought with her the song she wrote on that fateful night in Aspen, the timeless classic that would come to be known as Landslide. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. And because it's such a simple sounding song, I'd like to do things a little differently. Instead of going through the whole song front to back, I'm going to start by looking at the broad structures that define the core identity of the song, then I'll zoom in and look at some of the details that make this version so special, and we'll wrap up by checking out some of the more noteworthy covers to see how they do things differently. But first, big picture, starting with the orchestration. The first thing we hear is Buckingham's guitar, and throughout the entire song, that's pretty much all we get. And that's really interesting. I mean, this is a song by Fleetwood Mac on an album called Fleetwood Mac, but it features neither Mick Fleetwood nor either of the McVees. Landslide was written as a Buckingham Nicks song, and the band decided to leave it that way. This limits their ability to create a compelling dynamic arrangement. You don't get that cathartic moment where the drums come crashing in, and you don't get the somber weight of a deep resonant bass line. And what options do exist for creating distinctions between parts on guitar mostly go unused. There's no moments with soft, held chords or loud, aggressive strumming. It's all this same fingerstyle arpeggio creating a very consistent level of sonic energy throughout. The arrangement is less like a journey with clear highlights and moments of rest, and more like an open field where everything is the same for miles around. It's not taking you anywhere because you're already where you need to be, it's just letting you get lost in it. There are some dynamic fluctuations as Buckingham plucks the strings a little harder in some sections than others, but they're some Subtle. The track isn't getting louder and softer, it's expanding and contracting, almost like it's breathing almost like it's alive. But that's not to say it's not moving. Buckingham's arpeggios have this sort of locomotive groove to them, with clear, strong beats marked out by the bass line played on the lowest strings, and near constant 16th notes filling all the spaces in between. <laughs> The slow, deliberate pulse, surrounded by rapid motion, creates a clear sense of momentum, pushing the song ever forward toward the next beat, and that driving groove is used to outline a pretty simple chord loop. We're gonna be hearing these same four chords for most of the song, but to understand why they work so well with this groove, we have to ask what the song is about. And of course, there's more than one answer. The lyrics are pretty abstract, and they leave themselves open to multiple interpretations. But to me, Landslide has always felt like a song about the passage of time, the paths we walk on in our lives, and the way those paths narrow as the future becomes the past. It says, sure, tomorrow is always a new day, and you can always make new choices, but the choices you have available are shaped by the events of yesterday, and as you get older, there start to be a lot more yesterdays, and not nearly as many tomorrows. Nix wrote this song at a crossroads, where she was considering abandoning all the effort she'd put into her music career and starting over, and that wistful sense of being trapped by your own past past, trapped by her own decisions, resonates throughout every element of the song. Obviously, that's not just because of the chord progression, but this is the perfect chord progression to capture that mood. Like, first of all, using a chord loop is obviously correct. A long, sprawling harmonic journey with clear cadences, digressions, and an ultimate destination wouldn't work. You want to sit in a single harmonic location, and that's what loops are for. 
But more than that, this specific loop is really well suited for the song. By sticking to constant stepwise motion, each chord leads into the next with no clear points of arrival to break up the monotony. You're putting one foot in front of the other forever without ever really going anywhere. You can feel each day passing by as the landslide carries you helplessly through the events of your life. And on either side of that stepwise motion, we have two almost identical chords, E flat major and C minor 7. As far as I can tell, the upper structure of these two chord voicings is exactly the same. The arpeggio plays all the same notes, just over a different bass. Even the motion in this loop is an illusion. It's all sitting still, but it's sitting still on a moving train. The only time we break from this chord loop is in the bridge, where Buckingham plays this... which looks like a whole new thing, but it's actually just the same three chords all shifted down a perfect fourth. Moving lines up or down in fourths is pretty common in guitar-based music because all you have to do is play the same pattern but start on a different string, so this is pretty much the smallest change you could make without changing nothing. The normal loop is supposed to end on a B-flat chord, but since the new one starts on a B-flat chord, they avoid the weird redundant transition by switching one chord early, setting it up with the F chord that would be here in the new version. The bridge alternates between this B-flat loop and the modified version of the E-flat loop, which pairs really well with the lyrics. When Nyx sings about the change she's afraid of, it's the unfamiliar B-flat loop, but when she talks about the life she's built, it's back to her old friend E-flat. And that brings us to the most important part, the melody. Landslide is, at its heart, a vocal showcase. Not in the sense that it lets Stevie Nyx show off her incredible chops. The range is barely over an octave, and the runs are pretty slow. The song isn't all that hard to sing, but it's really hard to sing this well. The warmth and poise of Nix's voice is on full display here, making full use of this beautifully simple melody. There's three melodic sections, each one radically different from each of the others. In a song with so few components, it's really important to make each one stand out, and this song is a perfect example of how to do that without losing cohesion. Let's start with a verse. I took my love, took it down. I climbed the mountain and I turned around. These are the shortest phrases, like stray passing thoughts. They're unconnected to each other, which she emphasizes by leaving a fairly long gap in between. These lines serve as lyrical brushstrokes, individual splashes of color that form the backdrop of the song's story without offering or requiring much explanation. Melodically, they're fairly straightforward. We start on B-flat, the fifth, then drop down to E-flat, the root. On the way, though, we make a quick stop off on F, the second, dissipating all that downward momentum as she steps down the rest of the way. The line has a a sense of gravity to it, like your ear is being pulled back to E-flat, and the F helps drive that home by filling in some of the space between the two notes while still being clearly subservient to the root. If she'd just done a normal arpeggio, I took my love, took it down it wouldn't feel as much like a landing at the bottom. This structure also lets her avoid singing the third of the key, thus hiding the tonality. Or okay, it's not really hidden, Buckingham makes it pretty obvious, but by avoiding the more colorful modal notes, especially when we're supposed to be in major, the melody takes on this sort of hollow quality that accents the overall sense of melancholy. Next is the refrain, And I saw my reflection in the snow where the melody has expanded in a lot of ways. First, it's longer, with less space between the phrases. It's also higher, while well, the verse topped out at B-flat, here we go all the way up to E-flat. And finally, it's more complex. Up to now, the melody's been exclusively pentatonic, but right at the start, we get this strong accented D, the major seventh, bringing a new sort of tension we hadn't previously heard. All of this tells us that this line is important, and that everything she's been singing previously should be heard in relation to what she's saying now. The image of the snow-covered hills is central to the entire song, and here she's spelling that out pretty clearly. After that, to wind us back down to the next verse, we get this, to the landslide brought me down which looks kinda like the verse, dropping from B-flat to F, then continuing down to D, but on either side, she fills in the modal notes C and G, so instead of hiding the tonality, she's embracing it. The second refrain doubles down on a lot of these ideas, in some cases literally. One of the advantages of using such a consistent loop is that without clear points of resolution, it's easy to lose track of time, so they can stretch it as needed. Nix uses that to get away with singing the primary refrain melody twice in a row, building anticipation for the upcoming chorus, and 
she replaces the second half, the bit about the landslide, with a simple run with the same basic structure to avoid winding back down. The second refrain also goes a bit higher, with this F Ocean tides. being pretty much the highest note she'll sing all song. All this helps keep things from getting too repetitive. Even in a song where repetition is the point, it helps to have some sort of interest curve. And finally, we have the bridge melody. Well, I've been afraid of changing Cause I've built my life around you up to now, the phrasing has been pretty natural, with roughly the same cadence she'd use if she were just speaking the line, but here she adds these pauses as if this thought is harder to put into words. We also see that in the melodic structure, the whole thing is built on a simple motif of a descending step, first from G to F, then C to B flat, and so on. These steps imply a downward angle to the music even as the overall melody rises. And while they seem like a new addition, they're actually all over the song. In the First, we had that slide from F to E flat. Took it down. And while the refrain is more animated, it still often approaches its most important notes by step from above. Flexion. This motif is a central component of the song as a whole, and the bridge is bringing that to the forefront. The entire bridge melody follows it, except for the ends of the phrases. Here, she finds herself on a low F, and we'd expect her to step down to E flat. Build my life around you. But instead, she turns around and steps the other way up to G. Around you. This prevents it from feeling quite as final, and it also emphasizes that color tone that she was hiding in the verse. It also does something else, but... We'll get to that later. First though, I'd like to move on from the big structures and talk about some of the little details that make this specific recording work. This is gonna be a bit less organized, mostly just highlighting random moments that speak to me in no particular order, but to maintain some semblance of narrative structure, I'll start with Buckingham's parts. The most obvious thing is, of course, the guitar solo. This is the only time we hear anything that isn't acoustic, and the whole thing is drenched in reverb, so it sounds like it's echoing to us from a long way away. For a song about being stuck in the pattern of life, it seems only fitting that the solo be basically the same thing twice. It's an eight-bar solo made of two four-bar phrases, and the first half of each of those phrases is basically the same B-flat major arpeggio. The first time, he sticks with that B-flat theme for the rest of the phrase. evoking the harmony of the bridge with its richer, more colorful tones. The second time, though, he replaces it with this big run down the scale, which doesn't really imply a chord so much as a direction, the same direction we've been implying all song. When I'm analyzing a solo, one of the most interesting questions is typically how it ends. Does it work its way up to a big triumphant climax, or gently fade out so the rest of the song can continue? Here, it's definitely the latter. Buckingham is musically passing the baton back to Nyx so she can get back to her story. As with everything else in the song, the solo isn't an event, it's just a moment, and moments pass. Slightly less obvious, is what's going on with the acoustic guitars, and yes, I said guitars, plural. Although Buckingham is the only one playing, this song actually features multiple layers of acoustic guitar tracks. I'm not entirely sure how many, some sources I found say four tracks and that sounds about right to me, but I couldn't find anything definitive, so there might be more. But anyway, there's definitely a double-tracked version of the main pattern, and then at least a couple extra layers for accents in different sections. These accent layers allow them to subtly modify the arrangement in moments of particular importance without ever losing the driving groove underneath. Like in the bridge, there's a whole new counter line... with a slower rhythm and some new rhythmic accents to play against the main melody and subtly emphasize the significance of this particular section, but because it's the same timbre as the rest of the background, it doesn't call as much attention to itself as, say, adding a drummer would. But even less obvious, and probably more important, is the impact of the double track itself. The foundation of the song is Buckingham playing the same arpeggio in two separate layers panned to opposite sides of the mix. But while they're basically the same pattern, they're not 
exactly the same pattern. He's playing this entirely with his fingers, giving him a very nuanced touch, and the subtle differences between the two performances create this echoing soundscape where the single guitar part gets split in two and then recombines as it reaches your ears. To demonstrate what I mean, I'd like to play you the first moment in the song where I really notice this effect underneath the first refrain. Try to follow along with the bass line, but don't follow it in pitch. We already did that. I want you to follow it in space. Which direction does it sound like it's coming from? <laughs> Did you hear it? If you didn't, or if you just don't have stereo speakers, what happened is the first three chords had their bass note sounding from the right, but the fourth one sounded from the left instead. The note moved, and it continues to do that throughout the song, swirling around unpredictably in the acoustic space. Now, I don't know if this was intentional studio wizardry, or just the natural result of Buckingham hitting the strings slightly differently in different takes. It's probably a combination of both, but the point is that this sort of thing is happening all over the song, so this single guitar part feels like it's coming not from a single direction, but from everywhere. Like the loneliness of that cabin in Aspen, the song surrounds you in all directions. And finally, let's talk about Nyx. There's a lot I could say about her vocal performance here, but most of it can be summarized by a single moment in the first line of the second verse. Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? And look, I'm calling this final note in E-flat mostly out of respect. She's wildly out of tune. In fact, it's so flat that I briefly considered the possibility that she was trying to sing a D here, but after comparing back to the first verse melody and looking up some live performances, I feel pretty confident in saying that she's thinking of this as an E-flat, that's just not what's coming out. And to be clear, I'm not bringing this up to make fun of her. This isn't one of those vocal teacher reacts channels where I pick apart all the little technical flaws in someone's vocal performance for... fun? Is that fun? Do people enjoy that? It just seems mean. Anyway, this isn't that. I don't care if her technique is flawed here because I actually think this works really well. But to explain why, we have to talk about how this happened, and I think the best way to do that is to look at how she sings this line in the first verse. I took my love, took it down. Here, she's much closer to the actual note, but the tone of her voice is noticeably softer, and for the second line, I climbed the mountain and I turned around. She barely touches the E-flat at all, sliding down to it from the F as her voice fades off. But in both lines in the second verse, she's using a much fuller, stronger tone, and she's just bottoming out. It's too low for her, and her voice is collapsing under the weight she's trying to bring down. She doesn't have the range, at least not yet, but she's pushing herself down there anyway, and she's not able to control it. So why is that... Good. Well, the most obvious advantage of going down to the very bottom of her range is that it lets the rest of the song be pretty low as well. If this E-flat is the lowest note she can handle, then setting most of the song in the octave or so above it means it all gets wrapped in this rich, warm, lower register tone. Even when she goes up to higher parts, like in the bridge, it's only relatively high. This whole melody sits comfortably in my range, and I'm an out-of-practice baritone. Low voices often carry a sense of age, maturity, and authority, and although Nyx was only 26 when she she wrote Landslide, it's one of the most mature, world-weary songs I've ever heard. The warmth and depth of her voice convey the song's message far more clearly than any of the lyrics, and losing the occasional note off the bottom is a small price to pay for that beautiful, rich tone. But it's not just a sacrifice making one moment worse in order to make the rest of the song better. I actually think that missing this note in specific is a brilliant move. Why? Well, let's listen to it again. What is love? When she sings that E-flat, or rather, when she doesn't, she's doing it on the word love. She's asking a simple but profound question here. What is love? And by being unable to sing the line in tune, she's answering it. She repeats that on the next line as well, where she asks if she can rise above, and again, the vocal delivery makes it pretty clear that she can't. Now, honestly, I don't think this was intentional. Again, I compared this to live performances, and especially later in her career where age and wear had lowered her vocal range, she hits the E-flat just fine. But also, they did choose to go with this take, in this key, and I have to assume someone in the studio noticed how flat she was. Also, in every other section of the song, she avoids resolving to the E-flat at all, ending most of her lines on G instead to keep it in a more producible range. So while I don't think she meant to do this, I also don't think it's fair to call 
it a mistake. But Landslide is more than just a Fleetwood Mac song. While it was originally written as a very personal expression of Stevie Nicks' specific situation, she managed to tap into something almost universal. It's one of those timeless works of art that feel like they've always been around, as if even their first version was somehow a cover, and many great artists recognized that quality and decided to try it out themselves. We can learn a lot about a song like this by looking at what other people do with it, so before we go, I'd like to look at some of the more famous covers to see what they have to say. Besides the original, the best-known version is probably the Smashing Pumpkins cover, so let's start there. This is actually a pretty faithful reproduction, sticking mostly to the composition and arranging choices made by Fleetwood Mac. It's even in the same key. But of course, it's not identical. The arpeggio is a little different, there's a new solo, and there's this one melodic change where for the first line of each verse, Billy Corgan ends on a G. Which gives it a bit more of a trajectory, delaying the resolution to E flat until the second line. But for the most part, the Pumpkins version is paying tribute to the original, not reinventing it. And yet I still think it's a really successful cover because they changed the one thing they absolutely needed to change in order to justify its existence. They changed the singer. Again, Landslide is a vocal showcase celebrating the unique tone and depth of Stevie Nicks' lower register. But these notes aren't low for Corgan. This is a fairly comfortable middle register for him, so instead of leaning into a thick, resonant chest voice, he takes on a soft, breathy, almost childlike tone. While Nyx sounds resigned and resolute in her delivery, willing to accept whatever her fate winds up being, when Corgan sings stuff like this, Can I sail through the changing ocean? He sounds genuinely scared. It's a different kind of anxiety, one that isn't quite ready to let go of the idea that he's in control. Next, we have Tori Amos. She mostly performed this live, so I'm going to be referencing the version from the live compilation album Y100 Sonic series, because it's the highest quality recording I could find. This one's a little more different. She's playing piano, she's changed the key to sit in sort of a mid-low range, so there's some of that warmth on the low notes, but still some thinner highs as well, and of course, she's bringing her own unique voice to it. But the thing that really sets this take apart is what she does to the groove. For most of the song, she de-emphasizes that driving quarter note bass line, and she plays around with the time feel, slowing down on certain lines to let them hang in the air. And I handle the seasons of my life. This makes Amos's version feel more retrospective. It has a different sort of tiredness to it, one born from looking back at a long and difficult past, whereas Nyx is looking forward to a long and difficult future. And finally, we have a cover by the Chicks, or as they were known at the time, the Dixie Chicks. This is the most radical departure from the original. Here, I'll play you a snippet, and I want you to see if you can figure out what they changed. But Did you catch it? Yeah, it's everything. While all the other versions we've heard were a single voice over a single instrument, the Chicks have added three-part harmony, an upright bass, a banjo, and some percussive strumming to mimic a drum kit. They've also lowered the energy in some sections in order to set up others. If you climb a mountain and you turn and the thing is, according to most songwriting advice, this is a better arrangement. It's got a clear interest curve, marking out changes in sections by bringing different parts in and out to create an exciting journey with a satisfying climax. This is production 101, but I can't help but feel like something got lost in translation. Fleetwood Mac's version had this not quite helplessness, but nakedness. It felt exposed in its vulnerability, but with all their polish and shine, I don't get that from the chicks. Their cover seems hopeful, almost defiant, as if to say they could stand up to the landslide, turn back time, and make everything end up alright. And maybe that's what they were going for. I don't think this is a bad take on the song. It's just different, and I think listening to the chicks' version makes it very clear why Fleetwood Mac did theirs the way they did. But that's the thing, isn't it? Great art is rarely about one idea. What makes Landslide such a timeless classic is that it's open for interpretation. Dozens of artists across decades and across genres have been able to use it as a canvas to tell their own stories, and listening to each of those versions provides a deeper context for my own experience. Landslide is about Stevie Nicks's anxiety over her failing career, but it's also about so much more than that. Each of us has our own Landslide, our own version of the story she's telling, and each of us can find that story somewhere in this song. The fact that so many different artists with so many different stories 
stories have chosen to tell them through landslides speaks to the magic she managed to capture on that lonely night in Aspen, and it speaks to the legacy and impact that a truly incredible work of art can have. And hey, thanks for watching. Thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Kevin Wilimowski, Grant Aldonis, and Michael Mole. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.